So right off the bat, I'm using that uh, seven letter word, storing our public forests and protecting them from logging. Now there hasn't been a tremendous amount of logging in most of our public forests in, in the recent past. The problem is that the pace of logging in our public forests it will be on the increase. There's been a, a ton of logging on our private lands ever since the inception of the Farmland Preservation Act. Uh, I mean, not the Farmland Preservation Act, the uh, Farmland uh, and Woodland Assessment Act in the 1960s. And that spurred a lot of uh, woodland management projects on private lands in order for uh, land to be farmland assessed and uh, kept from having to be sold to developers. However, and there, you know, there are certain rules that go along with those uh, that farmland tax assessment program, but that program is completely unsuitable for public lands. Since the 1960s, we've spent billions of green acres dollars acquiring uh, public forests, and all over New Jersey, in every county, um, municipal forests, county forests, state forests, parks, wildlife management areas. And almost none of those forests are protected from commercial logging. So the state natural area system was created 60 years ago uh, in 1961. And the first state natural area was the Shins Branch Atlantic White Cedar Swamp Forest in Lebanon State Forest, now called Brennan Burn State Forest. And the proposal was to clear cut this a very uh, old Atlantic white cedar forest to create shingles and other cedar products. And uh, some members of the public spearheaded by uh, David Moore um, decided that it was time to create a natural area system for, for state lands. And so this was the very first state natural area. It's a spectacular place. The trees are probably approaching 200 years old now, but they were only 120 or 130 years old when the system was created. And that's about the age of many of our big trees in our forests now, and especially in the highlands and ridge and valley section of New Jersey. So it's time that we start taking a look at all of the forests that need to be uh, protected from commercial logging and designated as natural areas. So here's a map of uh, the New Jersey highlands in black outline. The green is, um, New Jersey DEP lands in the highlands, DEP owned lands, and the purple are natural areas. You can see that uh, there's less than 10% of our forests that we've purchased with our Green Acres money have been set aside as natural areas. And there's barely been a new natural area designated in the last 30 years. Um, so uh, th we need more natural areas. And one of the reasons that these lands Additional lands haven't been designated as lack of funding, lack of funding for the natural areas program, uh, lack of funding to do surveys. And that whole Office of Natural Lands Management has sort of been uh, defunded over time, while many other DE pro DEP programs have remained steady or not, uh, not lost their funding to any, uh, any, anywhere near that extent. So take a look at this. There are two kinds of places. Uh, there are natural areas, which are lands owned by the state of New Jersey that have been at a much higher level of protection. The natural areas are governed by a natural areas council. Any management decision has to run through the council. And it doesn't mean that we often hear that, oh, natural areas are locked up and nobody can do anything. Well, that's not true. If something needs to be done on a natural area, the process goes through the natural areas council. And uh, those folks on the council are from every realm of biological science and the public, and they can decide if something needs to be done in a natural area. They're not locked up. They're not protected from any kind of restoration or whatever work might need to be done if there's some sort of calamity. Now at the time in the 1980s, also a lot of lands that where we knew had exceptional natural resource value, rare communities, incredible biodiversity and rare species were designated as natural heritage priority sites. That's the map on the right. And the natural heritage priority sites were private lands that were high priority acquisition targets for the Green Acres program. The Green Acres program that the people of New Jersey have consistently funded for 60 years. Uh, you know, these are high 
priority targets. And many of those lands have been acquired and many of those lands would qualify to be designated as natural areas. Here's a close up of a lot of the New Jersey highlands. And uh, you can see that there's a tremendous amount of land now colored green that is owned by the people of New Jersey and, and managed by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And many of those areas, you can see that the pink natural heritage priority sites overlap the green. And so those natural heritage priority sites should be designated as natural areas, um, or at least strongly considered for designation. And this is not happening uh, because of a lack of funding and a lack of will. And so we have this catch up to do. We need to determine the areas that are strictly protected from management schemes that have nothing to do with protecting biodiversity, rare communities, and rare species. And we need to set them aside as natural areas so we can stop arguing about some of the most important sites uh, in Northern New Jersey and throughout the state of New Jersey. So here's an example of a natural area in the Pine Barrens. This is the East Plains Natural Area in Stafford Forge Wildlife Management Area managed by the, the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, but this natural area embedded within that, that land, of course, anything that happens there has to be overseen by the Natural Areas Council within the Office of Natural Lands Management. That's the, the group of folks that I've mentioned that the staff has been uh, declining and the office is getting fewer and fewer funds as the years pass. These natural areas are some of the most spectacular places in New Jersey, and we need to spend resources in order to protect them. In particular, in the Pine Barrens, one of the most important things is learning what to do about wildfires, how to protect people from wildfires, how to, the, how to, the, how to manage the land so that fires can continue to uh, promote the natural processes of the New Jersey Pine Barrens and, and, and continue to allow the incredible biodiversity to flourish. Um, in the center of this map is a private property, the New Jersey Conservation Foundation Franklin Parker Preserve. And uh, it's um, governed by a forest stewardship plan. You've heard reference to forest stewardship plans. In order for the Conservation Foundation to do management of this land and to be able to try to uh, work out schemes for promoting rare species and and uh, taking care of the land and do prescribed burning and, and uh, various other activities, uh, we did go through the process with the state of New Jersey and the Pine Lands Commission to develop a forest stewardship plan. The one thing we did, which is not required, is we did rare species surveys and we continue to do rare species surveys. It's going on uh, almost 18 years. In this uh, particular instance, we know after all these years of study, where the rare wildflowers are. We know where the rare snakes uh, nest and den and have critical habitat components. We know where the 12 different territories of the threatened barred owl are on the property. We know where their nests are. And we know a lot about insects, dragonflies, damselflies, and a whole wealth of other rare species. So in formulating our forest stewardship plan, um, we can take those things into account. And none of those things are required. Normally in a forest stewardship plan, a, 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 a private landowner only has to um, look up in the database, which is uh, woefully inadequate, what rare species might be present and write a few paragraphs as to how they might avoid impacts to those species. And those same rules apply to the state of New Jersey. And although there's been a lot of progress made by the DEP in starting to do rare species surveys and trying to be a bit more careful about uh, avoiding impacts to rare species and rare communities, it doesn't always happen. So here's an example um, <clears throat> where the New Jersey Forest Fire Service helped us, or actually did it themselves. They created a fire break on the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, Franklin Parker Preserve inside this yellow area to protect those houses that you see uh, in, the, in the forest on the, in the upper part of the photograph. It doesn't look like anything has happened there. Um, the only thing that has happened to create that fire break is a thin sand road about six feet wide was bladed through the forest and you can see that tiny little white line. And then <clears throat> uh, the, 
the uh, understory, the uh, shrubs and the tiny saplings and very small trees were mowed in order to clear the forest understory. It's a 150 foot wide fire break. The process is called thinning from the ground up. And the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection has been employing this process now for a few years uh, with tremendous results. They haven't had to resort to commercial logging to create fire breaks in most instances, but not always. And it's very effective and it, and it creates an area where the Forest Fire Service can defend uh, residential areas or other uh, human occupied areas from wildfire. Now, the thing about this is that we didn't have to remove a lot of trees. In fact, almost no canopy trees are removed. You can see there's hardly any difference between the forest inside the fire break, between the two yellow lines, and the forest on the left-hand side of the photograph where nothing was thinned at all. Here's an example of a much more aggressive fire break around a retirement village where 90% of the canopy trees were removed. And, uh, in, in the pine barrens, when pine trees are removed, there's no real market for them. Uh, they're pitch pines and they're uh, of really low quality. And so they're just uh, pulped or mulched. And so any anytime that happens in the pine barrens, all of, the, all of that wood fiber only lasts for a short period of time. It either uh, you know, gets converted into mulch or other products that you know, don't last long and all that carbon goes back up into the atmosphere. So now that's not to say that that's not an effective fire break. And it's cheaper to do it this way because uh, if you have to do that forest mowing, it costs money and time and energy. Whereas if you do commercial uh, wood product removal, that almost pays for itself. It still costs money, but it's not, not as expensive. So there's a trade-off. What should we be doing? Should we be worrying about keeping the carbon on the site, keeping the carbon on the ground and keeping the canopy intact? Or we should be trying to do it the cheap way and removing the canopy and not dealing with the, the uh, long-term carbon storage issue. So this issue of defending carbon, defending the forest from wildfire, is called carbon defense. And the idea is to uh, try to protect people and the forest and the habitats without necessarily clearing the canopy. Now, the state, like I said, here's a, another very recent fire break done by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection in the same area as that last one where the canopy was removed and they're moving toward uh, not removing the canopy. And that's the same housing development just around the corner from the previous fire break. And you can see this one is much more uh, hard, hard to notice even in aerial photographs. So this is much better for our atmospheric concerns. Now, what do we do with the land where we don't make fire breaks? The wildfires generally come from the Southwest and from the direction of that arrow and the uh, the forests are very susceptible to, to burning incredibly intensely just like the uh, forests out west. The pine barrens are highly flammable. Uh, they're very different from the forests in the rest of New Jersey and so we wildfires are a real concern in southern New Jersey. So what do we do there? Well once you have that yellow fire break then you can do a prescribed burn and this is a real prescribed burn. These are the the tremendous folks from the New Jersey Forest Fire Service, they, they know how to do this better than anybody, safely, carefully, and uh, they can con conduct a controlled burn. And this controlled burn, we tried to make it as hot as possible to mimic the effects of a real wildfire, which are ecologically beneficial. And so it looks like that's, you know, like, any, like anything that you've seen from the, the films of the forest burning down in the Western US, and that's a pretty amazing fire but it doesn't kill most of the trees. So how many trees did it kill? Well, this is an actual, this is six months after a wildfire. The wildfire was in, uh, I'm sorry, it's about four months after a wildfire. The wildfire occurred in uh, July, I believe, and this sampling was done in early October. And uh, what we did was we went and counted all the trees, whether they were alive or dead, and we collected the data. And in that wildfire, 17% of the trees died. 60% of the trees were still alive, even above ground, the trunks and the canopies were still alive. 24% uh, of those trees were dead above ground, but the roots were alive and they were re-sprouting. Now in that prescribed burn that I just showed you, the, the amount of tree death is even less. Less than 10% of the trees die, more than 80% of the trunks survive. So we've 
uh, essentially thinned the forest a tiny bit. We've protected, we've gotten rid of all the fuels so that a wildfire can't really uh, come through there anymore. So everyone around is protected from wildfire. We've mimicked the ecological benefits of wildfire to some degree. And yet almost all of the canopy trees are still alive and we haven't lost much carbon to the atmosphere. And those canopy trees, obviously their trunks are still alive and they're gonna continue to sequester carbon for decades. Now, Northern New Jersey is completely different, right? It's not a highly flammable forest. The chances of incredibly widespread wildfires are very rare. And in fact, with the problem with that we've had over the years with deer and uh, you know destroying the forest understory, and you'll hear more about deer from another scientist later on. Uh, the problems we've had, there, there's often in many cases, a fire can hardly even move through these forests because there's nothing growing near the forest floor anymore. So that's a challenge, right? We have to restore these forests in Northern New Jersey. We have to uh, get the saplings and the seedlings and the shrubs to survive the onslaught of the deer and the invasive species. It's a, that's, that's the primary concern about Northern New Jersey is protecting our forests from degradation because of deer and invasive species and pathogens. Now, the most important forests where we need to keep them as healthy as possible are the forests that have never been tilled by agriculture. This map shows the extent of those forests in the late 1800s. And uh, the, the amount of forest today is much greater than that. There, there are uh, um, probably equal or more uh, acres of forest that used to be agriculture in the 17 and 1800s that are now covered in forest. There's a huge difference between the two. These maps are incredibly accurate. C.C. Vermeule surveyed the entire state of New Jersey and you can go to one of these places using topographic maps and go to where there's a division there between forest and open ground and you'll often find a rock wall. Still, uh, you know, just, just uh, as they're portrayed on those uh, 140 year old maps. Now on the left side of this rock wall is a post agricultural forest that used to be some sort of tilled farmland and the farmers and their kids spent years piling up all the rocks into this gigantic rock wall. It's about eight feet wide and about five feet high. Um, on the left side, there's a high soil pH. There's very little organic carbon in the soil. The soil, the forest soil has been made into an agricultural soil. It's essentially been wrecked from the point of view of growing a native forest. So it's filled with invasive species, invasive shrubs, weeds. There are very few native species in the understory. The forest on the right, is on soil that was never ruined by agricultural practices. I mean, ruined from the point of view of the forest, right? It's a completely different kind of soil. It has a low pH, it has a lot of organic material, and it has native plants, and it's much more resilient and resistant to invasion by alien weeds, and it has much greater biodiversity. Those are the forests that we need to leave alone. We need to let them mature, sequester carbon. They're, they're not even beginning to get old. The oldest trees are probably 120 to 150 years old, and they'll live for another century or two. And we know now that these forests are sequestering carbon faster than they ever have in the past. And uh, another speaker is going to talk more in detail about that. Where we need to spend our time fixing the landscape is on the left side of this rock wall, getting those forests to contain, invas contain native species instead of invasive species and working really hard to solve the deer problem, which is driving the system. So let's take a look at one of the forest stewardship plans, uh, which is essentially a logging plan for, uh, for a tract in Northern New Jersey on public land. And on the left, inside that yellow oval, you'll see the letters OG. That says that that area is designated as old growth. Well, it's not old growth now. In fact, what they're designating for old growth in this forestry plan is an area that was farm fields uh, probably 150 years ago when C.C. Vermeule was mapping the area and that's shown on the right. So it's, it's a curious thing that many of the forestry plans, uh, the harvesting is going on in the best forests with the biggest oldest trees and the areas that need to be restored and fixed are being termed, uh, termed old growth reserves and because there's nothing there of any value, so they're just leaving them alone instead of restoring them. Um, so that's a problem. It's a big problem. It's sort of like bait and switch. And then using the word old growth is, is, is just really, uh, it just really is just not right. Um, and in fact, 
and if you read the plans, they talk about old growth characteristics. Many of the plans uh, say that a target for a particular patch of land is old growth characteristics. That doesn't even mean old growth either. That just means uh, cut a variety of trees, some big, some small, leave a lot of branches and debris on the ground because in an old, true old growth forest that's hundreds of years old, you actually have uneven age, you have giant old trees, lots of young trees, tree trunks on the ground from trees that have blown over and fallen down, right? So the idea when, when forestry plants talk about old growth characteristics is to um, just sort of mimic that structure, but it has nothing to do with the ecology of an old growth forest where the biggest oldest trees are hundreds of years old. And those are the trees that are uh, dominating and driving the system. And those are the trees that are being selected for by nature, because those are the trees that have managed to resist the onslaught of nature over the centuries. Here's a, a little bit of data. Um, the uh, green and red bars are uh, the distribution of all the trees in the forest, in the canopy. These are not the young trees or the saplings or the, or the trees that are middle, uh, uh, a mid height. These are the canopy trees. And uh, the left are the smaller size classes of canopy trees all the way out to very large diameter canopy trees on the right. The green and the red are all of the trees combined. The red are the trees that were logged. So uh, it's clear that when logging is done, and I'm gonna use the word because it is logging. Uh, when logging is done on public lands in Northern New Jersey, the big trees are the targets. Now the forestry plans say that the middle sized trees are the targets, but this is almost never the case when we actually go see what was logged. Um, I, there's something that I call the 18 inch diameter discrepancy where many of the forestry plans dictate that trees over a certain size will not be harvested. For example, one plan on a county park land dictated that no trees over 18 inches in diameter would be logged. Well, when we went and we measured the, the forest stand, there weren't any trees over 18 inches. So that was a throwaway comment. Yeah, we're not gonna log any trees bigger than the trees that bigger, you know, that aren't there. We're not gonna log any of the trees that aren't there. None of them were bigger than 18 inches. It was pretty uh, disheartening to see these things written in forestry plans. Um, as Elliot mentioned, county and municipal parks are particularly at risk because plans can be written with absolutely no public notice, no public comment. And as this site in Hunterdon County was discovered by a researcher, uh, the trees were weeks away from being cut down. All the biggest trees and one of the oldest forests in Hunterdon County, there were incredible rare plants that would have been destroyed, shade tolerant and shade loving plants. And yes, there are such things as shade tolerant and shade loving plants that can't survive when the canopy is opened up. And uh, if that had happened, which thank goodness it didn't, this is about 12 years ago, uh, the, we would have lost incredible uh, biodiverse resources in that forest in the Hunterdon County Park System. Luckily it was stopped, never happened. Right after that forest didn't get logged, this quote appeared in the New Jersey Forestry Association newsletter lamenting the fact that that forest was not cut down, an article specifically about the fact that Round Mountain was not logged. And uh, I'll just let you read that. Um, it just shows you what we're up against. The mindset of a lumber industry and a timber industry and a forestry industry that thinks nothing should ever get old. So there are lots of things that we can do in our forests. Um, <clears throat> we can girdle trees if we wanna make specialized habitats and let them fall and leave the carbon in place. You can see a girdle tree in the foreground and you can see a bunch of other trees that were girdled and eventually fell over. And all this young forest is regenerating to create a habitat for rare species. These are small scale things that we can do. Um, and of course, you're gonna hear a lot more in some of the talks that are coming up about protecting our forests from deer and invasive species. And I just wanna leave you with this slide. It's a white pine that's emerging from the forest canopy up in uh, uh, Ringwood State Park. And uh, the fact that this white pine is emerging above the canopy of oaks tells you that this forest is starting to get old. Um, the white pine is a canopy emergent, which grows way taller than all the other deciduous trees. 
and we can see them emerging from the forests of the northern New Jersey highlands and Ridge and Valley provinces now because the forests have been left alone for, in some cases, over 100 years. And so we're starting to see the signature of forest approaching old growth. And we can protect these forests through proforestation to sequester carbon. You're going to hear all about that in a couple of talks that are upcoming. And that should be uh, something that you look for when you drive around the forested hillsides of northern New Jersey, when you see big white pines emerging above the canopy in the middle of the forest, you can look at that and say, holy mackerel, our forests are just starting to mature again, and we need to leave them alone. Thank you very much.